Listen up. We are back. Another episode of the Construction Mentor Podcast. I'm going to do something different. Never done it before. Uh, I'm going to have somebody on a second time, and it's actually going to be back to back, and there's a reason for it. We have Rusty, the wealthy iron worker. He was on last week, and I'm bringing him on again because we got to talking after we stopped recording last week, and we were talking about a lot of very important things that I we both acknowledge are not addressed in the industry. I've done a couple episodes on it before, but I've never really talked to somebody about it. So it was refreshing to hear uh, Rusty's perspective, and I think we align on a lot of things, and we both have a lot of different life experience to bring. So uh, that's what we're going to concentrate on here. And the reason that we got onto that topic uh, was because of something that recently happened in Rusty's life that I became aware of. Uh, his son recently passed away. Yep. And I am amazed at at his ability to, you know, handle that situation. But I think that I think that's part of what we need to do a better job of. Uh, not to prepare ourselves necessarily for that, uh, but to build stronger foundations, particularly as as men. So, um, Rusty, if you could just start off by giving a little bit of insight to what you've had going on in your life and what that's been like. Oh, boy. Um, <clears throat> so it's been a. Um, it's it's been it's been a couple of weeks. Um, it was about two weeks ago. uh on Saturday, so it's a little bit more than two weeks, about two and a half weeks almost, um, that I found out that my 24-year-old son had passed away. And um, like the first, there's different stages of grief. And I got some articles that are coming out on my website and just like personal things as I'm writing, you know, when you come to talk about that stuff. But there's a, the first week or so when you're taking off work and you're making schedules and, you know, you're scheduling all the stuff that, you know, normally is associated with that kind of thing. It's more of a distraction, um, at least for me anyway. It was more of a distraction because you're not in your normal routine. You're not in your, I get up in the morning and I go to work and I do the things that I normally do. And then you have to process that stuff. So the first week is, at least for me, that was the first week. I was back to work the second week because I I didn't want to push off or kick the can down the road, as it were. I was ready to, like, let's just get in there and begin this process of the normalcy and then and and then just wrestle uh, with the grief, as, as it were, throughout. Let's just get, let's just pull the bandit off. Let's just go to it, you know. And um, <clears throat> so this past week, it was my first full week back to work. And now, I'm, you know, it's my second week, midweek. And um, whoever described it, as I think it was Vicki Harrison has a really good description of grief talking about how it comes in waves like the ocean ebbs and flows. And so I've been, that's how kind of how I've been describing it because you, you, you think you got it all good. You're not thinking about it. And then you see something or you hear something and there's this wave. that just comes in and just knocks you down. And then you, you, well, you deal with your emotional, um, <clears throat> you deal with your emotional, uh, issue at that point, and then you get back up and you do it again. And that's this, this idea of perseverance, this idea of tenacity, um, this idea of, to use your words, like building a better foundation as it were, I think is really key, uh, to, to not just myself, right. Not just to, to me handling the, the whole concept and, and issue of grief, but I think it's something that we need to really be talking about from a cultural perspective. And I don't and I don't just mean from the construction cultural perspective, even though that we can take that view. I mean, culturally from a country or the Western perspective um, in our our push right to um, to to bring more women into the trades and to do a bunch of different things that we're trying to do. I think sometimes we end up demonizing men in general. And because that's the case, you you're not, you're eroding a foundation that somebody may or may not have. It might be thin, it might be frail, um, but we're eroding whatever foundation they may have to deal with grief, which leads to, you know, what the conversation you and I were having after our podcast episode, which is um, the, the epidemic that the construction industry has. I did listen to your podcast on that after we had talked, I think it was episode 59. Um, I did listen to it, listen to the stats and how alarming they are and how, you know, we, we've got to 
build up that foundation, that perseverance, because there's, there's a, any number of things that as a, as a man, um, like for me, my family, I'm the, I'm the rock, the anchor, you know what I mean? Like you got your kids and, sure. and your wife is dealing with all this stuff. And then, Oh, by the way, you still have to grieve too, but you have to be that rock for them. And so navigating that whole space, um, uh, I, I really hope that no one ever has to deal with it because it's not an easy, um, it's not an easy road to hoe. It's not an easy task to, to undertake. And it's probably the most, I, I was saying before, like the first part of the week, I was saying when people ask me, I'll say day by day, and it's the hardest thing I've ever done, but in reality, I'm not done with it. So then I've had to change my terminology right. and say, it's the hardest thing that I'll ever endure or that I've ever had to endure at least up to this point. Um, and I'm sure that there's people that will be listening to this podcast episode at some point that are going to go, yeah, wow, that's, that's, that was me. I had to deal with it or, or whatever. And I think that we need to basically make ourselves more, um, this, this rugged individualism that we sometimes fall into, I mm -hmm. think, I think does us a lot of damage. It's nice. Don't get me wrong. You know, um, to a degree, I'm very, you know, I'm a very individualistic person myself, right? I'm an introverted heart, but at the end of the day, we're never meant to do life alone. And no more do I see that really playing out today in, in our industry, right? And we're supposed to be our we got brotherhood and all this kind of stuff that we're, we're talking back and forth. But at the end of the day, do we really have any genuine friends that we could call at 3 a.m. in the morning because we just found out that, you know, our son has passed away or our daughter has passed mm -hmm. away or somebody. And you don't hear them making excuses for, you know, why they need to go back to bed because they got work to do in the morning. They're like, all you can hear is them getting ready and, and heading over to wherever you're at to, well, to, to use a biblical analogy, to be like Job's friends, just sit there and they, there's nothing I can say. Like that's been some of the most refreshing thing is when someone right, says, but to be there. Yeah. I, they, they say, I don't have any words. <clears throat> that's really refreshing. And I, I have had, I've had a lot of people reach out, but they say, I don't have any words. And I, you know, you hear the standard, like if you need something, give me a call. And people are like, I, I assure you, I mean, it. I assure you, I mean, it. and I'm not saying that they don't, but when you say I have no words, now this is like a level of honesty because I don't have any words. I've had people tell me like, I don't even know if I can do this. I don't even know mm -hmm. if, if I could handle um, the loss of a child because they put it into, it hits home. You know, they got 16 year olds, you got 18 year olds, you got 20 year old kids. And then they begin to, I guess, put themselves in the, in the space that I'm in. And they say, I have no words. And I, I know what it's like to, to be able to say I have no words. You know, I think you you hit on something that's really important to understand. And I'd like to go, you know, talk about your foundation a little bit and how you took the brunt of what sounds like it was a surprise. It didn't sound like you were expecting that to happen. Um, you, you said that you're not over. It's not over. Right. Yeah. It's something that you're enduring. And I think that we have a tendency as humans to work towards an end to get to the next thing. And like, like there's a box that eventually is going to be checked and then you move on, but there's a, so much in life, including building a foundation. It's also maintaining a foundation. I, and whether it's grief, I don't know anybody that's ever lost a child that the grief ends, right? It's going to be something lifelong that you have to endure. I don't know anybody that's battled addiction and that ends. That's a, that's a lifelong battle that somebody has to endure in a foundation that they keep having to go back and, and, repair and maintain what is it about your foundation of where you are in your life now that you think is working for you and you know had this happened 10 20 years ago maybe it wouldn't you know you wouldn't be i don't want to say you're handling it well but um you're you're able to be that foundation that rock as you described it for your family uh and prop them up while while you try to find your time to to grieve yourself um, I, what I would say is, and I don't never push, um, I like to have conversations with people I like to have open and honest conversations about it. So I don't never push like my own, like faith onto people, but I'm always itching to have that conversation with them because they, they look at, let's say the way, um, I don't want to say the way I carry myself, but it kind of is that way. You know, um, I, I don't, there's a, there's a saying, um, being a man without a country, and that has it has that's what it's felt like to me for a long time in in some ways because I don't do some of this what I would say is stereotypical things 
um, that some people in the trades do. Um, and that's not fine. I, you know, they, they can do whatever they want. I'm not, you know, judging mm-hmm. them, but that's, that's just me personally, right? I'm a very family oriented man. You know, I've been in this trade for a long time and I know so many guys that would want to work every ounce of overtime, um, not because they love money, which that certainly is the case, but because they didn't want to go home to their family. You know, because they didn't want to deal with the chaos or the noise. Maybe they felt like they were unable to deal with it. And that's never been my perspective. You know, I've, I've got a fantastic wife and she's, you know, the ironworking career, right? Tipping the hat to the conversation we had before. But this career, the trades in general, especially the unionized trades, um, it's enabled me and my wife to make specific and intentional choices to where she can stay at home with our kids, homeschool them pass our values on to them. And then, you know, conversely, the school day is much shorter than public school system. Um, they're, they're well ahead in, in any and all metrics that you can possibly measure them in. And they've been very well traveled too. So providing that, like, you know, when you look at this idea of joy, I get joy, not from the little things that I do and that they do come around. But I get joy from providing for my family and seeing them happy through that provision, if you will. And so all of this, you know, kind of comes back to like, where does that foundation come from? For me, it comes back to a, a biblical framework. And interestingly enough, I think there's a lot of people that are in the trades that while they don't openly talk about it, you'll see them. They'll give they'll, they'll tip their hat a little bit to certain little things in in conversation, or um, they'll see things that you do, or see things that other people will do that jibe with them. But they don't like just come openly out and have a conversation about that. And I'm not entirely sure why that is, but um, I can tell you now that it has certainly helped me out to be that. Uh, it shapes your worldview, if you will. You know, I mean, whether you don't believe in God or whether you do, it's going to change exactly how you live, right? You're going to live like, well, I don't believe he exists, so I'm going to live <laughs> in, in that way. Or I do believe he exists and I believe I'm going to be accountable to him. Therefore, it shapes my, you know, my fundamental reality of the way that I'm going to live my life. And so for me and from this grief perspective, um, circling back to the question you asked, I think that um, I think that when I process this, I don't process this as that I'm hopeless. Um, If I did, I could see where that would be almost completely overwhelming to the point that there is no recovery, but I don't believe it's, I don't, I don't, I don't believe that I'm hopeless. I I don't know. Furthermore, to take it even a step further, I don't believe that this is the end either. If I'm being honest with you, um, I think the scriptures say that it's appointed for man to die once and then judgment. And so you're going to, you're going to, you know, kind of give an account if you will. And so that whole perspective, when I go, okay, I must see him again. And that's, that's tough for some people to really wrestle with, but the unexamined life, as far as I'm concerned, is not worth living. So, you know, big picture. Yeah. I think, you know, one thing that I found interesting as I was a, yeah, I, w- I would say I was a, a an avowed a- atheist up until about two years ago. And I would even make fun of people. You know, you see Bill Maher. He had that movie that came out, Religious, like 15, 16 years ago. And he's like, well, why don't you kill yourself now if heaven's the place to be? Um, and I, I kind of had that perspective and I didn't really understand it. And I also didn't understand when people would say, you know, faith, family, country, you know, in that order. And I, I get it now because, again, whatever you believe in, you need a faith or a value system to serve a greater purpose. And that has to be first and foremost, because that guides the family and enables you to, you know, provide for your family and and structuring that family should serve that purpose. Um, And in the event that you lose a family member, um, that doesn't make your house of cards collapse, right? Because then, then you can't, then you can't serve anymore. And I never really fully uh, understood that until I was uh, with a neighbor who had, experienced some loss in his life. Um, and I don't push faith either way. I think there's a lot of parallels between the Bible and stoicism. I would always point somebody if they don't believe in God or anything like that, I would point them to the Stoics. I can almost, almost positive. You're familiar with the Stoics, Marcus Aurelius and Epictetus and Seneca and all those guys. Um, 
because the parallels are the same, right? If it's not faith in something else, it's faith in yourself uh, and not living in the past, not living in the future, just dealing with right now, giving the right sense of purpose or meaning to things that have happened to you and then just taking the best action today. Um, and I think that there's a, there's a lot to be, to be said about that. What I will say is anybody that I know, particularly in construction, the people that have overcome addiction or divorce or depression or losing somebody, the one common thing that they all have is faith in something, usually God. Yeah. Um, and that was one thing that I was looking at. And, and I even found it interesting when I, I was looking at a bunch of people that I was, that I look up to business people, influencers, podcasters, authors, like everywhere I look left and right, some geniuses, right? Some people yeah. that I look at and I, I look up to and they all have strong faith. And I'm like, well, what's going on here? Like, what the hell am I missing? Like, why am I an atheist? And all these other people who got tens of millions of dollars and see all the logic in the world and play it to their advantage to the riches. Like, what do they see that I don't see? And I think that's it. I think it's, I think it's serving that your faith and, and your belief system first and the rewards come. And sometimes that, that, uh, gives you either the answer or the meaning to some of the thing, other things that happen in your life. Um, so yeah, again, not, not to push, you know, religion or anything like that on anybody, uh, but also not to hide from it. Right. Like, I, I don't think that it's a, it's a bad thing because if there's somebody out there like myself who would be listening and they'd be kind of questioning, or, you know, maybe they, maybe you don't believe in something, uh, it's something that should, should perk your ear up. And what I, what I will say is my reasoning was always like, oh, you gotta, you gotta show me to believe it. And like, I'm a science-based guy and I'm a facts guy. But like I said, if I know anybody that's overcome something, they have strong faith, right? And if, if the statistics say, and they do that having stronger faith allows you to live longer, happier, healthier, wealthier, the statistics say that, then there's something to be said about the prescription, right? Science world says uh, you know, you have to, you have to come up with a thousand vaccines and a, and a thousand pills and you have to test, test them a thousand different ways before they look at the results and then tell you what the result is. And they say, oh, if you take this pill, there's an 80% chance it'll cure an arm growing out of your rear end. Uh, but, <laughs> right. Like if, if that's accepted as science, right. Mm. <laughs> and that, that's now a prescription for an illness or an obstacle that somebody has in their health, then why isn't that enough evidence for the prescription of faith to be something that you should acknowledge as real and something that serves your life right particularly in a situation where you you have grief or you have depression or you have anxiety or or you're struggling uh, with substance abuse so I'll, I'll tell you there's a few different talking points here um uh nature abhors a vacuum um i i think that to be honest with you yes i am familiar with the stoics i think a lot of the stoics um derived some of their uh, some of their talking points, quite frankly, probably from the, the biblical narrative to some degree, probably to an overwhelming degree. Um, but I've, I've always said this, too, because you're talking about the, the the faith application, all the people, you know, why, why isn't this same standard applied? I've said this for a long time now that people will believe anything as long as it's not in the Bible. They'll believe anything yeah. as long as it's not in the Bible. You could tell them I saw aliens and you're like, oh, I make sense. You know, I'm well, and then, but you need to turn around and tell them, uh, you know, something, you know, and they want more and they want more and they want more. And there's, there's some reasons, you know, for that, I believe, but, um, nature abhors a vacuum and you're, you're, you're going to, at some point, I, I said it earlier, the unexamined life is not worth living. One of the reasons why some of those more, some of those people who have that, that strong faith and they have this, this take on life, that's absolutely different. Um, or it's fueled by something different, but they examine life for what it is. They don't let life happen to them. And that's a, that's a big difference. There's a lot of people and, and that I've come across in, in my time that just allow life to happen to them. And what life does then is bowling them right on over instead of them being intentional about what they're doing, the choices they're making. Um, and all those little micro decisions that lead up to, to bigger ones. And a lot of that, a lot of times it's very fueled by faith as you've rightly observed, but nature abhors a vacuum. You're going to, you're going to, um, whether it's you find, or, or let's say worship yourself and worship your outcome and all that stuff, 
or right, you're going to watch something different. You're it's going to fuel you to some degree. You know whether it is your, you know whether it is to be honest with you, whether your God is um, pleasure uh, or it is self gratification or whatever it happens to be. And the people that I have found that take a step back and view life through a a critical thinking lens, or I'll take it a step further through the lens of discernment, because critical thinking, the difference parted, you know, down to the nitty nitty gritty is critical thinking is just, I'm being critical about what you're saying. Whereas discernment, I'm trying to ascertain not just what's wrong with what you're saying, but also what, what is right overall in this whole dynamic, right? The, the people are, when they take a step back and they say, okay, well, let me have a look at what's going on here. They can ascertain through, you know, through their discernment, whether or not, okay, well, this doesn't seem right, but this seems wrong and navigate through some things. And they go, ah, I can see I'm, I'm out for my own, my own gratification versus somebody else's. And they put in, uh, whether they believe or not, at least the biblical principles that seem to be applied uh, in in large parts to a lot of people. And that's why you can have, that's why I can have this almost incomprehensible amount of grief that comes your way, right? There's There's no word. There's a word used to describe somebody who's lost a parent. There's a word used to describe somebody who's lost a spouse. There's no word used to describe somebody that's lost a son or a daughter or a child. And that and that almost incomprehensible amount of grief. It's why I can sit here on this podcast today and do the, the previous one with you and tell you after we got off that, hey, oh, yeah, by the way, this is what I have going on. I can sit here and do it primarily because I'm fueled. My, my cup overflows, if you will. I have that foundation um, that as I've been building on for a number of years now. And I think that there's a lot more people who are interested if they would just be honest with themselves and do some evaluation, seek out the truth, if you will. Yeah. I, so truth seeking is a very interesting uh, perspective, right? I know a lot of people, again, that would shun the Bible, <laughs> as you said. Uh, and that's why I point people to the yeah. Stoics. I've done this with a friend of mine from college where I've said, you know, everything that they say is literally a parallel of the Bible. And I think it, between, it was actually two books. I, I would also point uh, to A More Perfect Union from Ben Carson, who, regardless of politics, he's a neurosurgeon. He's a freaking brilliant guy, <laughs> if you've ever, yeah. if you know who Ben Carson is. Uh, and what he pointed out to me, I love America. And I love the Constitution and the Declaration and all those things, all right, written to mirror the Bible. And it's like, well, that's interesting, because when what happened when you made the founding documents for a country to mirror the Bible, it became the biggest superpower in the world, like in, a, in the blink of an eye from the perspective of the world right so more more evidence to the prescription in as as a historian and a science and an engineering guy right um but to to look at yourself and prioritize what's good for you or what enables you to grow and enables you to maintain a solid foundation over being right i think is is a place where a lot of us fall down uh, again, regardless of construction or wherever, but maybe even particularly men, because, you know, we're always in a measuring contest. Right. You are. Yeah. Uh, you know, don't prioritize being right. Pri prioritize, um, you know, growing and maintaining that foundation. And uh, the other book was Mere Christianity from C.S. Lewis. And, Lewis. and you hit the nail on the head. Uh, you know, C.S. Lewis, again, everyone knows C.S. Lewis's books, you know, um, but people don't. People don't really know him for his faith in, in the Mere Christianity book, which is interesting. I, I read it uh, because a friend had recommended it to me because I was going through my own growth process in a tough time. And again, I was shunning the religion and everything like that, but I was questioning it. And, um, you know, he was an atheist and then became an evangelist before he before he uh, passed away. And one of the things that he made me realize, and it kind of just brought me a step closer. I didn't really accept God as a real entity. Uh, but I think it's a conducive step for a lot of people. If you don't feel like you you can put your chips in the faith basket is um, accepting having faith in yourself. 
right? So maybe God isn't a being, a physical being with the strings, you know, above everybody, uh, but maybe a state of being within yourself. So whenever you read the Bible, it's much like that stoicism where uh, you don't concentrate on the future or the past. You give meaning to the past and you concentrate on taking the right actions today. You, you, it's almost like you pray to yourself and you pray to the universe or you pray to God uh, as though, you know, they're in control, but you're in control. You act as though you're in control uh, of of what you do and in, in the next step that you take. Um, you know, I had that last year. My mother passed away, and I struggled with that because I didn't talk to her for, for the last four years. Mm. And you know, I had my reasons, and she had struggled with addiction and abuse. And you know, I I had to draw. I felt like I had to draw a clear line, and I was very upset with the hand I was dealt, the things that I that I went through as a kid. Uh, the effect that, that had on my life until I realized some of the good things that she gave me, right? She gave me, there was a lot of positive things that she did give me with my personality and my impulses to serve other people and stuff like that. But uh, I really didn't come um, to peace with it. And I have to revisit this as recently as, as a week ago when my cousin sent me a bunch of pictures and a bunch of her stuff that I went through uh, actually in the last like three days. And negative thoughts started coming back in my mind until I thought about my purpose, how that became my purpose and how my past experience now enabled me to serve that purpose and to help other people overcome uh, those things. Not to say that, you know, God or the universe wanted my mother, you know, to be an addict or to die, you know, the way that she did or for your son to die, um, you know, the early, the way that he did, but, um, maybe that will enable the both of us uh, to serve other people that may go through the same. Yeah, I have no doubt. <clears throat> uh, I've, I've talked to that. I've said, spoken to that to multiple people where um, I know that, right, that who better to talk to somebody who's lost a child than somebody who's lost a child? Because then you give, um, I don't want to say, you give, let me see if I can say it in this way that makes it um, seem palatable. I hate to use the word street cred, but there's authenticity there, yeah. right? There's authenticity that comes from somebody who has endured before you the very same thing or something extremely similar, right? And that's a very tough thing to, to do, but... Um, you talk about, and I've heard you say this in multiple podcast episodes, you talk about purpose. Um, there's so many people, and I see the shirt on your, on, you're wearing, so many men are purposeless today, right? They're, they're so purposeless. They don't have a purpose. And, and when you don't have a purpose, you are likely to be exploited for somebody else's gain. You are likely to, instead of pursuing the purpose that you were made for, you are more likely to be exploited and used as a tool in someone else's toolbox to achieve their purpose. Um, and and the whole host of negative things that comes along with being purposeless, right? Um, at the end of the day, I don't want to say, I, you know, everybody does, right? So much wasted time. But I don't want to say, I, you know, I... I I wish I would have done this. I wish I would have done this because I've said it over and over again. Um, in 20 years time from now, you and I are going to sit, we might, we may have this conversation again, but one of the things that's going to come out of this is you'll regret the decisions that you did not make over the ones that you did because the land of what if just lives rent free in your head, but you can't even contemplate the land of what if and what all that you could have possibly uh, achieved through your purpose. If you are purposeless. And that's the reality for a lot of guys in the trades, man. I mean, they are just, uh, it's the, the, they have, I want to come to work. I don't even want to be there. I want to make a paycheck. I want to go home and I want to check out, you know, whatever yeah. your, whatever <laughs> your hobbies are, you know, wh whatever, whether it's, it can be sports, it can be golfing. It can be, it doesn't really matter what your hobbies are. If it, if it, if you prioritize that over your family, I cannot tell you the number of guys I've talked to. And when I first got in, when I first got in, I don't, I don't know if I told you this in the uh, previous podcast, it was or not, can't remember. When I first got in, they were like, do you got a felony? Do you got a D you got a DUI? Do you got a divorce? And I was like, nope, nope, nope. 
to all three. And they're like, well, you ain't going to make it, kid. And like, it's stereotypical and we laugh. But for everybody who has been through that, if they could look back behind them and in their pursuit of not even purpose, but in their pursuit of just money, their family is in, you know, there's a wake of destruction behind them. And most, most people would, would, would take a step back if they could and go, you know what? I wish I could, you know, reverse back time and, and make different decisions so that I could find my purpose. And then of course, not abandon what I, what I believe is probably a lot of people's true purpose for the, for the fleeting pursuit of money. Money's important, but it's, it's not, it's not the be all end all. Well, you, you just, you said something interesting there. So it's not just about, you know, when you say that if you have no purpose and nothing greater to serve outside of yourself, whether that be faith or, or even just uh, building a certain lifestyle, setting a certain example for your family so that they can mm-hmm. go do the same thing for the next generation, which is a perfectly good purpose, by the way. And one would argue that, you know, that serves many other you know things because the best thing that you can do, the best legacy that you can leave is a stronger generation, right? The next generation. So I don't, but it's not just about, uh, and I'm not suggesting that you said this, but it's not just about twisting the ambition, right? When when uh, nefarious uh, entities uh, then play on your lack of purpose and make you think that you're chasing money, you know, I think that a lot of guys in the construction trades they work to a mean as a means to an end to do less, right? They work like you said to go put their feet up at home, drink beer, and you know watch the grass grow and, and watch football on Sunday. And ultimately, like work until retirement. That's all. That's all. So many guys talk about, right? And that's not really serving anything. And I can tell you personally, in my life, um, you know, when I had my biggest pitfall and I was severely depressed and I was visualizing ways to, you know, end it, that I had to take accountability for what put me there. But what really put me there was the lack of purpose. And what I was trying to do was get to as a means to an end to get to a spot where I could do less but have a ton of income to even enhance my ability to do less and make it more enjoyable. Mm -hmm. I think that the other way that being purposeless plays on you again, is not to twist the ambition, like in the way that I just said, uh, but to, but to play in your victimhood, right? So if you don't have a purpose or something to reach higher for or work better for, or to build on uh, and rise up to every day or to handle the, the obstacles of life, whether you get hit in the face, you know, with an addiction or losing a family member, um, that victimhood can play on you in that way where you get taken advantage of by pharmaceutical companies. Um, and you know, you're told that you're a victim and you're told that you've been wronged and the boss is the man and he's beating you down and he's driving you as slave labor and you know, the whole world's against you and everything negative that happens in your life. Oh yeah. It has a meaning to it, but it's totally out of your control and there's, and, and it's meant to oppress you and to put you down. Yeah. And it's not your fault that you're there. And that's not a good place to be in, in mentally at all. Um, no, I don't know sense. anybody that, I don't know anything that has ever come good out of it. Right. Like I use an example. This is going to be a, a bad example, but it's just the one that's on top of my mind. I can't tell you how many people tell me that they have a thyroid problem. You don't have a thyroid problem. There's like a, the, 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 like, here's the thing statistically you're you're fat because of the way that you live right it's statistically impossible for everybody that i know that's overweight to have a thyroid problem but even if even if you do have a thyroid problem you know what doesn't help the way that you live yeah pills the pills and the medication that you take and the answer is still the same you got to exercise you got to get sunlight like you can't be a bump on a log all the time (laughs) <laughs> right. So it's so it's like if but if if so if you have no purpose and you're dwelling in nihilism and everything's against you and the whole world is meant to put you down and every all the chips the cards just don't fall your way, what do you do? You just end up falling into less and less healthy habits. You end up becoming reliant on the pharmaceutical companies with the pills that they give you for this mythical creature that you're trying to fight. And the answer is again doing less to get a result that you feel like you're entitled to. And that's just one example. That I could come up with off the top okay. of my head that <laughs> that <laughs> that kind of highlights that you know what I mean? Oh yeah, I mean I think about like from a, a cultural like this <clears throat> this this idea right. So um, when I say a cultural like a reckoning or a, an understanding, if you will, 
we have um, we have this unhealthy. Um, I, this is my take, but I think we have an unhealthy infatuation with youth. Um, we always want to be younger instead of being like, you know what? This is just another phase of life, another season of life. And what happens is we, because we don't look for our purpose, I'll, I'll play to that. Because we don't take the time to try to figure out what we're supposed to do, what is our purpose? Um, the things that are low hanging fruit that are incorrect, but they're still low hanging fruit easily to achieve. I'm young, right? So it's to make as much money as possible. Well, for, for what? And to, to do this and to have as many, you know, sexual exploits and all this other stuff that you get a little older because we're infatuated with youth. And then it's not there anymore. And then you're older and you're a different season. And because culturally you feel like you were lied to, that's where this quote unquote midlife crisis seems to stem from, right? Because you don't know who you are. You don't know what your purpose is. And because you don't know that you can get easily swept away. And then you just no holds barred. This is why so many, you see men that marriages implode because they they're looking to replicate the same thing that they thought was their purpose when they were younger. And it's not, but because they never took the time to really wrestle with it. And I might add one in four children, uh, grows up in this country without a father. So, so many of them were starting off, start, had unfortunately started off on the wrong foot because they didn't have somebody pouring into them and mentoring them and telling them from a family perspective, like, this is what matters and this is what, this is just garbage. Don't pay any attention to that. And, and th their lives just implode, just implode. And it's a, just a train wreck after train wreck after train wreck. And so much of this would be avoided if, you knew what you were supposed to do. If you had a purpose or if you examine life with that lens in mind, it would go so much smoother for so many people. And yet what's really quick, what's really easy, what's really comfortable is all the things that, you know, we, we were just talking about and just leads so many people astray to the destruction of so many families. And I, I can't do it. I, I can't do it. I won't do it. Right. And and hopefully, right, that this hopefully this podcast episode, somebody somewhere gleaned something from it. And it, you know, maybe it makes them think about, okay, well, what is my purpose? What am I supposed to be here? What am I supposed to be doing? How can I build resiliency and intentionality in my own life so that not just I benefit, but everybody in my sphere of influence? How do I do that? And if you can begin that process of self-reflection um, and internalization where you're, you're, you're just having that internal monologue and you're, you're really seeking out what it is that you're supposed to be doing. I guarantee you, you will be far and above most other people. And you may not be happy in all of your instances, but there'll be a joy that's there. That's far mm -hmm. more richer than any happiness you're going to be able to have or achieve or achieve or attain. Yeah, I think happiness is not the goal, right? Yeah. It's it's to fulfill a purpose. And yeah, you touched on masculinity in the home and the importance of it. And that's kind of why I got the shirt on that I have. So I want to go there in a second. But, um, you know, you, you had highlighted looking at some people in the industry. And I think that w one of the problems that we have in the industry is we set a very poor example and set a culture to live a lifestyle and to prioritize certain things that uh, don't serve. Right. So number one would be this this image of becoming a construction executive that takes people on boats and golfing and, you know, does less, but gets paid a lot of money to do it. And that's what I yeah. thought that I wanted to be. And then, you know, I in the beginning of my career, uh, you know, I Thursdays clear the schedule as soon as I could get off the job site, as soon as I could scoot away, meet up with the executives at the bar and go out. And, you know, a lot of those guys are married and I was young and I was able to pursue hot bartenders and the girls. And, you know, this is before I was married or, or had a serious girlfriend. And, you know, that was my purpose. And they were living vicariously through me. And I was rubbing elbows with all the executives. I thought that's what I wanted. Right. And I'm looking at these guys and I'm like, man, this executive, his family doesn't even expect him to come home because they know it's part of his job to go out and drink and party with the architects and the engineers and the clients on Thursday nights. And I thought that's where I wanted to be. Right. And that was part of his role. And that's what he got paid for. And, Again, it all revolved around this notion that the goal was to maximize the indulgence and minimize the work put in. 
and that, that's not a purpose, right? Yeah. That, 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 what purpose does that serve anybody? And what I didn't have the foresight to see at the time was the effect that that would have on them at the, on the long run. First of all, what I didn't realize was how long it took them to get into that position or what the path was like for them to get in that position. Right. I don't know what their achievements were like to get there. I don't know if it was nepotism or or mm-hmm. just happenstance or they were the best. Op- they were just the only person, warm body that could fulfill the job at the time. Like, I don't know what they did. I don't know how I don't know how they mm-hmm. got there. Right. And. And I didn't know where it was going to go. Right. So today now it's been 10, 15 years since I've seen a lot of these guys that were initially in those roles, divorced, depressed, dead. Uh, you know, whatever it may be, I've seen guys absolutely ruin their lives. I've seen guys cheat on their wives uh, horribly, uh, lose everything through divorce. I've seen people fall yeah. victim. I've seen people demoted from their jobs, ready to get at a $10 billion a year company, a C-level position and get demoted Oof. And, and, and miss out on promotions you know, it to be maybe a vice president or, you know, whatever that may be. I'm telling you, I have seen it all. Mm. And mm. the only guys that have ascended to maybe a chief position of any kind have been the guys that were able to kind of pull us up, pull away and be like, and maybe it's one out of 10, you know, and they were like, holy crap. Like I totally had to reset. And maybe it was because their wife gave them some grace and their family gave them some grace to reset their life. Um, because I know a lot of people that wouldn't have, but what I would say to young people is not to feed into that. We need to do a better job at setting the standard and what, and what the goals are. And I think that maybe this is a segue into the masculinity and the importance in the home, but what is it to be a man? What is it to be in the construction industry? What should your goals be? What kind of legacy are you trying to build? What kind of example are you trying to set? Because the stronger you are and the stronger the purpose is that you serve, the stronger your foundation is going to be, the more that ripple effect is positive for other people, their lives throughout the industry. And you're not falling victim to, uh, you know, what I would call nihilism or, or, you know, really a lack of purpose or misplaced purpose now today. Uh, and I know you're chomping at the bit, so I'm going to, I'm going to turn it over to you, but, um, (laughs) but you know, what is my purpose today, right? My purpose today is to serve my faith. What, what does that mean? And I can go into, you know, my analogies about the light and stuff like that, but My purpose is to present opportunities for people to improve their lives, pull them into affluency, whether that be a stronger foundation outside of work, opening them up to opportunities in construction, how to take full advantage of that so that they're self-sustained, they're not reliant on anybody that can then twist them, right? That they're financially free uh, and to set that example for my family, for my son. Not only do I want him to look at me as somebody that uh, never tried to do less, tried to achieve so that I could serve more and have a greater impact, uh, but be quite literally the walking embodiment of hard work, right? I bust my ass. I was on a, I was on a treadmill this morning with a 20 pound weighted vest. Uh, and somebody actually asked me, what are you training for? And my answer, not to sound like a hard ass, but it was life, right? I, because I want to be, I want to be, I want to, I want to, and I, uh-huh. I paused and I said, you know, my goal is to be disciplined about always pushing myself for a better result. And to have a bigger impact, right? And I can't, and I need to do that. I want to physically embody that for my kids. So when they look at me, there's no doubt. Um, but anyway, you know, that, that's, that's how I feel about it. And I, I'm thankful. The meaning that I actually have for my wife is, you know, not every moment is a shining moment in a marriage, right? Sometimes you argue and sometimes you get frustrated. And yeah, I remind myself pretty frequently that, you know, I feel like she was put in my life uh, because she can't, she'll help me come to that realization. And, and to, and to serve that purpose and all the other women that I was chasing at all the other bars to serve other people's purpose and to entertain them. They didn't make me want to be a better man, right? They didn't make me want to find a higher purpose and they didn't make me want to strive for that and to be that example for people in my family, outside of my family. And that's why I know my wife is the person that I, that I should be with. Yeah. So, um, there's a lot to unpack there, right? Yeah. Um, (laughs) You know, when I, when I started, um, even when I started like just to name the wealthy iron worker, it was uh, initially at least anyway, to basically go, okay, let's unpack, right. What is real wealth? And I, I, you know, more to your point about seeing all those people and the destruction of their lives or whatever. And then I've seen guys who go home every day 
to a wife that loves them and a kid and kids that respect them. Wife respects them. Kids respect them. He's able to provide, and he is far richer than any C-suite individual or anybody with a million dollars that has a train wreck of a family. Um, and, and this idea of contentment came to mind when you were talking about, you know, chasing positions or whatever, like, mm -mm. I'm going to do the purpose that I feel like I have. Everything else is going to be added to that. That that stuff will come, but I, I'm going to be content in the position I've got. And so, you know, the positions like, Hey, would you do this position or would you do that position? I didn't seek it out. It came to me. And this idea of contentment while you're doing your purpose, I think is, is lost on a lot of people. There's other, there's a, there's another uh, biblical concept that lives rent free in my head. And uh, it's actually a verse, but to him who has been given much, much more will be required. I feel like I've got some gifts that, and some talents, if you will, that I, I should be using for that purpose. Whatever the purpose happens to be for you or anybody else, you should be using whatever gifts that you have, whatever talent you have in pursuit of achievement of that purpose. And it, you know, oftentimes is to serve those other people. You feel like your wife was put in your life? My same exact way, same exact way. And she, it's a, it's a, it's a team for me. Mm -hmm where she's able to do the things that she's able to do because I do what I'm supposed to do. And that augments in it, you know, it augments in reverse. And so what happens then it's a steady upward climb to where she's able to do her purpose or fulfill her purpose. And I'm able to fulfill mine and we come together and I'm over here going, okay, well, not in my, not only am I trying to achieve whatever purpose that I may feel like I have, but then I'm like, well, what, how can I help her achieve hers or same thing with anybody on the field, out in the field? You know, are you, are you, how can I help you? How can I help you achieve whatever it is that you're looking to do? Oh, you need to learn a little bit of rigging. Sure. I'll help you out with that. Oh, you need to learn some welding. Sure. I can help you out with some tips or tricks or whatever. It's not the self aggrandizement and the self fulfillment that people that I believe that people should be pursuing. It should be the betterment of other people. And typically that's wrapped up in some ways, it's, at least in, in, in my purpose, right, is to is to sit here and do the absolute best I can with the gifts and, and the talents that I feel like I've been given. Right. It's one of the reasons why I write articles to the degree that I do and podcast and research podcasts and all that stuff that I do, because I want to walk a different path to set an example and not just for my family, right? I do it for, for other people at work too. And they say, well, he's clearly different than many of the other people that I've interacted with on a job site. Yeah, that's fine. And I'm perfectly okay with being misunderstood or, you know, somebody not knowing that's fine with me because at some point in time, I, I hope to be able to have a conversation and you can go, that guy is shedding some, some, some light on some topics or situations or difficulties for me or whatever it happens to be. I'll get guys that will call me years after I've worked with them because they have a question about this or they want to talk about something else. That takes time and, and the pursuit of purpose to achieve, if you will. Yeah, I think ultimately when you define a purpose, it's got to be something greater than yourself. And I've always tried to take that to mm -hmm. you know, working on site, even as a manager. Right. It's been years since I've swung a hammer or put on tools or anything like that. Um, but I look at my job as how can I make somebody else's life easier? How can I make them their them more efficient? You know what I mean? As opposed to what I think a lot of people do in the industry, which is uh, that's your job. <laughs> you know what I mean? That that's yeah. your job. That's that's your fault. You know, uh, don't you know. So I, I I think again, whether it's God or the universe or whatever that may be, as long as you're serving a greater purpose, that return is going to come back to you. As long as you're always genuinely trying to bring value to other people, uh, you know, in a much greater perspective outside of, outside of yourself. And if I were to say that there's any kind of healthy nihilism, I think that there's a balance in everything. Right. Um, and nihilism is a part of that, you know, whatever has happened, in a hundred years, we're all going to be dead. 
right? So, yeah. so whatever kind of embarrassment or shame you may feel, um, you know, Betty White, pretty famous. Everybody knows who Betty White is, but nobody's really talked about her since she, since she died, right? Nobody talks about her, her successes or her failures since she died. Right. So, um, you know, I, I think if you were to look at it in any kind of a healthy way, it's take a chance and be who you are and try to serve that purpose. And don't be nervous about the, what, what other people think about yourself when you try to serve that purpose. Like I'm sure a lot of people say a lot of crap about me doing this podcast and, and my content and what that looks like and whether or not I'm wasting my time or whatever that may be, or maybe even that, who knows, um, yeah. it's going to bite me in the butt one day and I get fired because I say something, <laughs> but you know what? I'm, I'm confident and I have faith that, um, I'm serving my purpose. Ultimately I'll get the right re reward for it. And in the end, if it's not the reward that I think that I deserve or that I want, uh, or something that may be even embarrassing, then 200 years, nobody's going to know the difference. Uh, if, if, <laughs> if nihilism <laughs> is, the, is, the, is the truth, right? So again, I wouldn't suggest a heavy dose of it, but uh, there's a little bit of that, that, that can serve you too. So, um, I want to talk about two other things and if we'll see where this goes and maybe this breaks off into another episode and I can separate it, but masculinity in the home, you talked about it. I think that uh, we've alluded several times that we either have a tendency or there's a plan uh, or, or something's in motion to pull men out of the home and to, and to demasculize men and to kind of take us away from what we're naturally wired to do or what we should be doing. And that's cracking the foundation or vice versa. We are not building the foundation to serve the role that we, that we should be serving. So we could go either way, but the two things that I would like to address is number one, the importance of uh, masculinity at work in the home. And um, I'd love to gain some insight to what some things are that you do other than faith that, that help you build and maintain your foundation.